Today we'll be talking about why systems fail and what you can do about it. Um, so this is based on um, my background at AWS running analytic and database services for about eight years. Um, and um, at AWS, we also used to meet every week to discuss you know, all of the issues that had happened in the prior week and what we could learn from each other. And so it's based on the combination of both as we grew uh, quite a large over that period of time. Of necessity, this is a somewhat superficial discussion of a complex topic. And reach out to me if you'd like me to talk more. Um, so the first reason systems fail is, is that we modify them. You know, if you're modifying something, it's more likely to fail than if you don't modify it. Uh, deployments are the most common source of outage minutes, both because the blast radius is large, you're changing your entire fleet, the changes tend to be complex. And you know, honestly, it's hard to get failure rates down below maybe one in 100, one in 200, because you know, there's human error involved. And finally, detecting, debugging, addressing failures take time. That's frustrating because these are largely unforced errors. So we were at AWS able to significantly reduce our failure rate. And let me talk about how. So at core, this uh, deployment issues tend to be a process uh, problem. And that's really encouraging because processes are comparatively easy to change as opposed to code or you know, introducing tool chains or whatever. So we basically, you know, at, we have a strong belief at Amazon about moving from good intentions towards mechanisms because mechanisms can be iteratively improved and maintain a collective memory. So for each deployment, we'd write a doc that would cover what's being changed, the downstream services that should be aware and may see impact. We'd very importantly, uh, organize the deployment schedule by availability zone and region so that you limited the blast radius of a change. You described which metrics you were monitoring and you described how rollback was going to be automated if the metric was out of band. And we also had this notion of a deployment bar raiser, someone outside the org who wasn't motivated by whether a deployment happened, but was motivated by whether it happened successfully. And so how did this help? Well, the first thing you do is you deploy to canaries to validate uh, things like performance, research usage, functionality against a known workload. Then by sequencing the rollout, you limit the blast radius. By automating the rollout, you ensure that the thinking happened upfront, not during on call. I mean, we used to aim for what I'll call 555, five minutes to deploy, five minutes to evaluate, five minutes to roll back. And so therefore, if you had an issue, it tended not to be an issue for very long. And then the template created a collective memory. And that was a virtuous cycle. As deployments became more reliable, they were done more often, they became yet smaller and yet more reliable. Sometimes people say like, hey, I can't roll back automatically because of my environment. But that's weird, right? Because lots of other companies seem to be able to do that. And so the basic way you do that is by splitting a change into multiple deployments. So an example might be make a database schema change, then write to that new table from the app tier, start reading from the new table, then start cleaning up the old artifacts. And in general, that you know the underlying principle is you make the interface change in your provider, then the consumer, and then you clean up the provider. And distributed systems at core require this. You can't atomically update everything. So you need to support both old and new interfaces before you move from old to new and the consumer. The second reason systems fail is operator error. Uh, you know, those were the largest outages we had. You know, I listed three here, uh, which are very were very painful memories for me, but uh, you know, I won't go into them in detail. Uh, so the main thing that you have to realize is, is that humans have an error rate, particularly when they're doing repetitive mundane tasks. So you either need to pair program if they're making a manual change. You need to make manual changes excessively rare. You need to push those into some sort of operator console. And you need the operator console-based changes to limit the blast radius at core. So as an example of that, RDS multi-AZ flips over from 
a uh, database that it can't observe to, uh, in an AZ to its pair in another AZ. But if it's doing more than X of these failovers in Y period of time, it'll instead uh, stop doing that and uh, raise the ticket instead, because maybe it's the observer that's gone bad rather than the AZ that in which the database is living. And it's really important that ops orchestration tools for production ops do this by default. Not all do. The third reason is black box components. So as an example, you know, a lot of our large scale events involve databases because they have a large blast radius, they take a long time to recover and they change underneath you, for example, in the optimizer. And also people often under administer their databases. It's, all, it's not just about databases, it's true of edge routers, cloud services, lots of stuff. Um, and so the core lesson here is, is that you want to limit the functionality that you don't control. And so, for example, you might say, let me not use a relational database and instead use a NoSQL system. And that not because it's intrinsically more reliable, but because it fails in pieces, in one table rather than the entirety of the system. It's less functional, it's less expressive, but that means that the remaining, the functionality is expressed in your own code, which lets you control your own fate. And the basic idea is you're trying to build an escalator, not an elevator. And what I mean by that is an escalator, you know, when it fails, turns into a staircase, right? And so it operates, it degrades. Whereas an elevator, when it fails, turns into an elevator shaft and it fails catastrophically. And you want, you know, you want to design for one versus another. And examples of that might be things like caching IP addresses uh, and uh, you know, so that most control plane APIs continue to work, even if your DNS provider is, has uh, failed or keeping a warm pool around to buffer EC2 control plane or maintaining local disk to buffer an outage. And you know, finally, let's be real, everything eventually fails, right? And so you, this is where you've got uh, commonplace failures and first time failures. And so for commonplace failures, a lot of us build runbooks to reduce human errors. But the problem with that model is, is that there's still a human in the loop. And intrinsically, that's gonna take an hour or two in terms of reaction time, even for a well understood issue like uh, a disk that's full. Um, you know, Google said that on average, there were 200 minutes of downtime across 150 LSC large scale events in GCP last year. That's large, that's quite a lot of time for a really well run company that understands SRE. And so, the only way really around that is to automate that. Anything that's well understood must be automated because it's useless toil and it's extended unavailability. The problem in that world is, is that each remediation is a, tends to be a custom multi-month project. One of the things we're doing at Shoreline, which is the company, I, the startup I run now, is to try to build an automation platform that makes it easy to build a remediation in minutes or an hour with only shell scripting skills so the SREs can do it themselves and have the system itself handle the distributed systems complexity of changing infrastructure, cascading issues, governing, blast radius, all of that stuff. And then the other big space is first time failures. Now those are fundamentally hard because observability tools have lag and dashboards and logs often lack data for a new event so you end up having to open up a blizzard of SSH windows. And so the basic underlying issue is, is that production ops is a real-time distributed systems problem. And what you want is a system that supports real-time views into changing resources and metrics per second, and that integrates a view into resources metrics and Linux commands, basically building a, a distributed system that looks like a single system image to you so you can uh, where you can view and modify the environment while the uh, system basically controls blast radius partial failures retries etc that's again more of what we're trying to build at shoreline because this is the system i wished i had with that uh, thanks very much and uh,
uh, you know, reach out if you have any questions.